In this lesson, we are going to be dealing with year-end adjustments and also preparing financial statements. So our objectives are to complete the year-end adjustments, to prepare a post-adjustment trial balance, to close off all the related accounts, and then to prepare a post-closing trial balance, and to prepare financial statements at the end. So if we start off with what would normally happen at the year-end, the procedures would be to prepare a pre-adjustment trial balance. This is after we've closed off all our general accounts, uh, balanced off all our general ledger accounts and know what each account is supposed to be worth. This pre-adjustment trial balance basically does look like your, your normal trial balance. So your trial balance will have your balance sheet section, which has all your assets, your liabilities and owners, equity accounts, and each account will have its balance on the correct side. In the nominal section, you'll then have all your income and your expenses accounts. Both the sides of the of the trial balance must balance to show that you've processed the double entry system correctly. After that, we deal with adjustment entries. Then we would prepare another post-adjustment trial balance just to check if we are still correct. Then we process our closing transfers and then we do a post-closing trial balance. Your post-closing trial balance does not have a nominal section because we have closed off everything to the balance sheet section. And then last, we'll then prepare our annual financial statements. So if we start off with our year-end adjustments, we basically have about 10 of them which are common, which we deal with. So you have your depreciation, accrued expenses, prepaid expenses, accrued income, income referred, uh, received in advance, also referred to as deferred income, consumables on hand, and inventory adjustments. Then our allowances, allowance for credit losses, allowance for settlement discount, and allowance for settlement discount received. We're going to be going into a little bit more detail with each of these adjustments. Let's start off with depreciation. Now, depreciation is written off to show a decrease in the value of non-current assets. So if you have a vehicle that you bought 10 years ago, obviously that vehicle does not work as it used to and its value is not the same. But in accounting terms, it's also for us to be able to spread the value or the cost of that asset across our different accounting periods so that we don't write off all the cost against profit of one year. For our purposes in this class, we're using two methods. The first method is called the cost price method. Also, it also is referred to as a straight line method or the fixed method. How this works is we would know either a percentage per annum of how to depreciate or the number of years it would take you to depreciate that asset. So for example, if we had an asset costing uh, 50,000 Rand and it was depreciated at 10% per annum on cost, therefore every single year for 10 years, we will write off the depreciation at 5,000. The entry to record this depreciation would be debit depreciation and credit accumulated depreciation on that asset. So if it's vehicles, it would be accumulated depreciation on vehicles. If it's machinery, it's accumulated depreciation on machinery. The second method is the one that we call the diminished balance or the reducing balance. or Also, it's referred to as the carrying value method. This basically takes your cost and less any accumulated depreciation that has been written off already. And to that amount, which is then the carrying value, we then multiply that by the depreciation percentage. So if we have an asset that is costing 50,000 Rand and our accumulated depreciation on that asset to that point has been 10,000 Rand, it means we will take the 50,000 minus the 10,000, which will give us 40,000. Then only do we apply the 10% uh, percentage of depreciation, which will then give us a depreciation of 4,000 rand. Our second adjustment is called accrued expenses. Accrued expenses are basically expenses which we must still pay at the end of the year. We know about these expenses, but we have not received anything for us to be able to record them. 
So for example, we know at the end of the month, we are supposed to pay insurance. However, we have not received anything from them that actually prompts us. We will then create a current liability called accrued expenses and, and basically record that, that expense. In the notes, our accrued expenses will be part of our trade and other payables note. Second example that at the end of the year, we find out that we have accrued expenses for insurance. We basically owe insurance 5,000 Rand. To record an accrued expense, you would debit to that expense. So debit insurance for 5,000 Rand and we would credit to this current liability called accrued expenses. Prepaid expenses are rather self-explanatory. So these are expenses that have been paid in advance for the following year. So we've already paid this year, but they relate to the following year. So this would be a current asset to us because if we were to close the business right now, we that money would belong to us and whoever we've paid it to would have to pay it back because we wouldn't receive the benefit in the following year. This would affect your trade and other receivables note and you would basically add these on to trade and other receivables in your financial statements notes. So the transaction to record your prepaid expenses would be to debit the current asset prepaid expense and to credit that particular expense. So if it is telephone that we have prepaid, it would be credit telephone for whatever amount that you have prepaid for. Accrued income is income that is still true to the business at the end of the year, but we have not received it. The most common ones is normally interest on fixed deposit, where we do have a fixed deposit account. We know how much the interest rate is every single year, but we have not received that amount by year end. We would basically create a current asset. So this accrued income account is a current asset and it would affect the trade and other receivables note. So if we were to record accrued income for interest on fixed deposit, you would debit the current asset called accrued income and you would credit that particular income account. So if it's interest income, you would credit interest income. Our next adjustment is called deferred income. Also, it is also called income received in advance. So this is income that we have already received in this financial year, but it refers to the next financial year. So if we were to close business right now, we will owe those people that money. So we create a current liability account called deferred income, and it affects our trade and other payables note in the financial statements. So let's say, for example, we own a building and someone has rented this building out from us and they have paid us a rent a month in advance. So at the end of the year, we actually have rent for the following year's first month. So to record that, you would debit the, the income account. So the rent income would be debited and we would credit the current liability with that one month's rent that is received in advance. So if we look at the summary, this table basically just gives you an indication of how the different adjustments would then work. So for example, if it's paid or received on this table, we show yes or no. So your prepaid expenses have been paid and your deferred income has been received. If it's payable or receivable, so your accrued expenses have not been paid, so they are still payable, and your accrued income has not yet been received. And we would we then tell you how to deal with the account with the accounts. So how to deal with your income account, your expense account, your assets and your liability account. If we then go on to consumables on hand. So your consumable stores or consumable items are things like your stationery and your packing material. What you're trying to do is adjust your consumables on hand account, which is a current asset account, and it forms part of your trade and inventory notes. Let's take an example of stationery. 
at the beginning of the year or during the year, we buy stationery. And let's say we bought stationery for 10,000 Rand. So we debited the expense account called stationery and we credited bank. We bought it for cash. At the end of the year, we would then do a stock count to figure out how much stationery we have. So in this case, if we've got 2,000 Rand stationery left, it means the current asset that we hold is only 2,000 Rand. So we would debit a current asset called consumable stores on hand, and we would credit our stationary expense. The end result of that is we'll be left with a current asset of 2,000 Rand, and our expense will now be sitting at 8,000 Rand. For inventory adjustments, it's exactly the same thing. All we want to do is adjust our inventory level to the actual amount of inventory that we have counted. So if we count that we have more inventory than what is actually in our books, we then create an account called inventory surplus. So we would debit inventory and we would credit the income account called inventory surplus. If the opposite is true, where we count that we actually have less than what we're showing in the books, then we will create an expense account called inventory deficit. So in that case, we would debit inventory deficit and we would credit our inventory account. Our allowances for credit losses is there so that we can cover ourselves against the risk that debtors won't pay their accounts. We also call this a provision for credit losses. It's in essence a negative asset because it affects your debtor's control account down. You would put this in the trade and other receivables account. So let's say for example, we're sitting with debtors of 250,000 Rand and we decide that 5% of those debtors probably will not pay us. So you multiply that by 5% then we know that our allowance for credit losses is supposed to be 12,500 rands. To then record that, we would debit credit losses and we would credit allowances for credit losses. As the balance moves up or down, we can decide to adjust this. And if we want to increase it, then we debit uh, credit losses and we credit allowance for credit losses. If we want to decrease it, then we would do the opposite entry, debit allowance for credit losses and credit credit losses. Our allowance for settlement discount is similar to the allowance for credit losses, but this is when we provide an allowance for discounts granted to debtors in the current year. It also works as a negative asset and it would lower your debtor's control and it can be found or it affects the trade and other receivables note in the balance sheet. To create this allowance, you will debit your settlement discount, which is an expense, and you would credit your allowance for settlement discount. So to increase it, you'll keep the same transaction. To decrease it, then you will do the opposite. So you will debit allowance for settlement discount and you would credit settlement discounts. Your allowance for settlement discount received is the same as your allowance for settlement discount. However, this one provides for discounts that we have received from our creditors for credit purchases. So it reduces our trade and other payables and would also affect your trade and other payables uh, note in the balance sheet. So to create this allowance, you would debit allowance for settlement discount received and we would credit settlement discount received because that is an income account. Once we have done all these adjustments, we would then prepare a post adjustment trial balance. And your post adjustment trial balance looks like a normal trial balance. It's just for us to check that the, the, the trial balance still balances. So the amounts on the debit side still equal the amounts on the credit side. Then after that, we start performing our closing 
and closing off entries. This is the only time we need to start worrying about the different inventory systems. So I'll start off with the perpetual inventory system. First entry that we do is close off our sales return account, which is an expense account, to our sales account. So you would debit the sales account and you would credit your sales return account with whatever total is sitting in your sales return account. Then we close off our settlement discount granted, which is our expense, to our sales account. So we would debit our sales account and we would credit our settlement discount granted. Then we close off our settlement discount received to cost of sales. So we would debit settlement discount received and we would credit cost of sales. The next closing of entry would then be to close off our sales account to a new account that we'll create that we call trading account. So we would debit sales and we would credit the trading account. Then we would close off our cost of sales to our trading account as well. So we would credit cost of sales and debit the trading account. If you balance off the trading account now, Whatever is left in there would either be a gross profit or a gross loss if it's sitting on the debit side. Assuming that it's a gross profit, we would then debit our trading account and credit a new account that we'll create called profit and loss for the gross profit. At that point, our profit and loss account will only hold our gross profit that we have made. Then we close off all our income accounts. So you will debit our income accounts and we will credit our profit and loss account with all the income account balances. Close off all the expense accounts. So we will credit all our expense accounts and we would debit our profit and loss with those balances. The profit and loss will then carry our profit for the year if we balance it off. Assuming we've made a profit, we will then uh, debit profit and loss and we will credit the capital account. And obviously here I'm assuming that this is a sole proprietor. So we only have one capital account and all the money belongs to the owner. And then last we will then close off our drawings. So we would credit drawings and we would debit capital. If you were to then look at the same closing of entries for the periodic inventory system, the only major difference there is that we don't have a cost of sales account, but we would have a purchases account. So we'll notice on step three, four, and six, instead of dealing with the cost of sales account, the contra account is the purchases account. On step seven, you would also close off any other costs related to purchases. So something like freight on purchases, insurance on purchases, you would also close off to the trading account. That is the only difference between the closing of entries on the periodic inventory system and the perpetual inventory system. When we prepare the financial statements, I would say go to your manual. The formats are very, very important. This should not be too much studying or too difficult studying, but you have to know the formats. For the statement of comprehensive income, you have to know both methods because in the perpetual inventory system, we do have cost of sales, but we have to calculate it in the periodic inventory system. For your statement of financial position, you must also know the notes that accompany it. And your statement of changes in equity will then give you the answer to your capital, which is which lies in your statement of financial position. Know the formats. Mm -hmm.